making uh, the fatalities in New York uh, reaching a record low. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Idanis Rodriguez. Well, it's always, you know, important to have a great partner in the other news to the music as well. And we want to talk about it. First of all, thank you. Uh, you are the expert. And I wanted to hear your ideas and, and your avenue like a five road lane. We didn't need five lanes at the time of the trip. The big five lanes probably at the moment were probably only one. But they were planning for the 100 years. Now it's up to us, to our generation, to continue planning for the next, not a hundred now, but for the next 500, for the next thousand years. That's our responsibility. So for me, as a, you know, as a father who has two daughters, 10 and four, and I hope that like, God allow me to leave long to see grandchildren, I hope to see my grandchildren, you know, with a city where we can say we can compete with other cities in the world that they are doing good work. Uh, so that's, you know, my motivation, whatever I do, is not thinking only about our generation. But it's about the great city that we've been building and that we need to continue to uh, for the future. Uh, I wanted to, you know, give a ask for, you know, a period of applause to being at it and the New York Institute. No doubt from the beginning they've been here, you know, in New York. So, and that's important. Uh, and for hosting us this morning, I also want to thank Matt Doc, who helped us to put this great event together, bringing in a truly impressive group of transportation experts in our city. And this is a testament uh, of, uh, to his strong body of work over his career hopeful with a real interest and desire in seeing innovative ideas come to fore to help more New Yorkers in a better way. I also want to thank the University Transportation Research Center who continues to bring policy makers and academics together to the benefit of the region. And to Cubic Transportation System, a, a, our sponsors today, and also a leading part of the Carfee Day when it comes especially to working to measure the results and collect important data about how New Yorkers are moving about. We will hear from them shortly about last year's effort and what we have planned this year. As many of you know, we started Car Free Day in New York City with a simple idea. There's so many ways to travel around our city that takes up less space, produce fewer emissions, and most importantly to New Yorkers, get you there faster. Let's find a way to celebrate them. This idea has grown and with the support of the Department of Transportation, without them we would not be able to pull it out as we have it planned for April 22nd this year, neither what we were able to do last year. We'll be opening up streets to people citywide, including 30 blocks of Broadway from Union Square to Times Square. Thankfully, in 2017, it takes less to convince New Yorkers to get around with our car than it, than it once did. We always had to remember, remember, remember only 1.2 million New Yorkers, like myself, own car in our city. The vast majority of New Yorkers rely on buses, train, and bicycles, and other motor transport. We made strides on our bike infrastructure with over a thousand miles of bike lanes and more of them becoming protected lanes every year. We seen historic historic high in subway ridership over the past few years, and our younger residents are less inclined to purchase a vehicle in our city. And yet we don't need the recent headlines to see how clogged our streets are with cars. We feel it, we see it, and its impact are severe. The 2006 report from the Partnership for New York City found that traffic congestion in Manhattan Central Business District alone cost the city $13 billion in economic activities annually 
and cause us to lose a potential 52,000 jobs. Beyond the immediate economic cost, bumper to bumper traffic adds to our carbon output, increasing our contribution to climate change. To free up space on our streets, I suggest several steps our city can and should take to ease congestion and ultimately rely less on buildings. To start, we must rethink the way packages and goods are delivered. <coughs> Trucks are a major contributor to congestion, loading and unloading often in the middle of the, of the street. With the increase in online retail sales, the Amazon effect, more trucks are delivering to homes as well. We can dramatically reduce the number of trucks on our street during the business hours if we require them to deliver goods to businesses at night between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. For personal deliveries, especially local ones, there is no reason why trucks and vans should be doing this work. Companies like UPS have already begun to tackle this challenge through delivering cyclists. Even for behavior items with electric power delivery tricycles, deliveries are much nimbler, nimbler and much energy and cost efficient. New York City must open the door to this methodology, and it is why I'm announcing my support to legalize. legalize a bike at the state level, I'm sorry, a e bikes at the state level and end the crackdown on an e bike here in New York City. For major delivery, of course, everything has to be regulated. You know, when you talk about e bike, does it mean that e bike should be speeding in the street? So, this is yes, the idea, then it's all about how can we work, you know, especially led by our city, DOT, and the rest of the institution that anyone that use e bike to deliver, they also have to know that pedestrian and cyclists are our priority and they always have to be keep safe. For major deliveries, we should never see trucks coming into our densest, densest areas. Coupled with the, mall, with the model above, we can look to develop delivery centers outside of New York City where truck traffic can be directed. And from there, have delivery cyclists travel, travel, travel see the city. I'm glad that Dr. Alexson Conway from CCNY is here with us on a panel today. As their research focused on these concepts, and we have seen them become more popular and forward thinking cities. As for garbage pickup, this also should be managed during nighttime hours. Keeping trucks off the street when they are busy. I'm working on legislation in the council to examine the potential impact of this strategy, but it makes sense that pickup during the day contribute to our congestion. These are short-term changes that will not require major investments in infrastructure. They are logistically change, changes that can seriously benefit our city and allow New Yorkers to breathe a little easier. When it comes to reducing the number of car commuters, we face different challenges. From the low price of parking to the free bridges into Manhattan to the preference to travel by car or a train <coughs> or bus, there's much we can and must change. We cannot allow the future New York City transportation to be car-centric. It must be sustainable and it must be through active and mass transportation if we are to remain a successful global city. But we have to be honest about reality. Our bus service is terrible. We lost two million annual riders over the past 10 years because buses, bus, buses are unreliable and can be even the slower, it can be slower than walking sometimes. Our subway system is overcrowded and disruptions in services are growing more frequent. Riders are frustrated, rightfully so, when they cannot plan a trip in a reasonable amount of time without delays or major service change impacting 
the right. Cycling is on the rise and should and shows so much promise. But to continue growing this model, model shift, we have to double down on protected bike lane. Looking to test our commuting by, I'm sorry, by bike need to, to feel as safe as they would on a train or bus if they're going to make the switch permanent. It also means getting serious about expanding city bike. When major portion of our city are cut off from this inexpensive option, especially those that need it most, we're not doing all we can to truly encouraging cycling. And that's why I support to bring public dollars into city bike. On the flip side, app companies have proliferated offering inexpensive rides. Consumers are making their choices clear when it comes to travel. They would rather tap a button, button and get a ride than deal with unreliable public transit, even if it's less expensive. The challenge before us now is to dramatically improve and incentivize public transit. It means doing so in a cost-effective way, levering private partnership and making simple but transformative changes. It means working in partnership across agencies. It means being ambitious and creative over it, tinkering at the status quo. To a start, we need a serious reset on both service system wide. We can no longer condemn the, remain, the remaining riders to the purgatory of poor service. We can and must develop real bus rapid transit in New York City. We cannot be behind Brazil, Colombia, and all the cities in the world. We need to set a serious goal of having every route use all door boarding, all board fare payments, transit signal priority, and dedicated and camera enforced bus lanes. Then we must go further. Thinking about set aside lanes, a great boarding and fully dedicated transit corridor or route far from subways. Buses should not compete with cars on our streets. They should come first. They move more people using less space with fewer emissions. It is simple science. At the end of this process, we can have a way for what effectively amounts to an above ground subway network. It is not a crazy notion, as cities across the world are already miles ahead of New York City. For our, subway, for our subways, we can also take cues from cities that have already started to figure it out. While they maintain a private system, Hong Kong subways are the envy of the world. The business community in their city recognize this and works closely to ensure trains are efficient and that if the system face delay or breakdowns, they are quickly fixed. The private sector contributes directly to the successful to the success of the subway system. There is a direct revenue sharing model where the subway system receives earnings from major commercial hubs like malls or office buildings in exchange for providing quality transportation to employees or consumers in these areas. While we have a dramatically different system built up over 100 years, both physically and bureaucratically, we do have the ability to leverage the New York City economy and is driving private businesses to make our subway system more streamlined and cost effective. To start, I encourage the MTA to look into the public-private partnership to create a adopt a station model, allowing businesses to advertise exclusively in a handful of stations. They could be required to have a station both in the central business district and beyond to ensure equity while covering the maintenance costs. This could remove these costs from the MTA and allow them to put it 
into service improvement, service improvement. It's in pressure to raise fares. But there are more ways to engage the private sector on this important need. <coughs> we need to look at new value capture models that, that even if not relying 100% on them for new constructions, can lower the cost of projects for transit improvements. After all, the MTA is a $1 trillion asset. It should be maintained like one. This means serious investments in capital improvements that go well beyond the five-year programs. It means dedicated revenue streams like the one Move New York put forward. And while I know this plan faced tough political wins, I believe there is still a way to move forward, even if it means allowing city residents, such as those from Queens and Brooklyn, to be exempt for new bridge toll to get it off the ground and get the funding the system needs to remain <coughs> in good repair. Getting serious about improving the system means real oversight on spending so that projects stop setting records for the most expensive subway project in the world. Improving our subway system and all our mass transit system is the only way to become less car reliance. Fundamentally, we must make the experience of not driving a car cheaper, faster, safer, and more enjoyable than the alternative. I'm eager to hear our panelists' ideas for this as well and as well, and I know that we can make progress as a city. This is a, this is a modest start, just like the idea of Car Free Day. I'm aiming to begin this conversation because the cost of inaction is too high. We have an excellent set of panels for you all this morning, and I hope you enjoy and learn something new today. Finally, I invite you all to join me, led by the New York City Department of Transportation, on the Earth Day, April 22nd, to leave your cars at home and enjoy great open streets with all the potential they hold. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, first of all, let's acknowledge and thank you for your progressive transportation leadership. I, I don't think we've ever seen a chair of the Transportation Committee, we've had some really good ones over the years, but who really gets the transportation, transportation ecosystem, looking at all this, the modes and sub-modes, how they work together, and two other things, you know, not just delving into really understanding crazy stuff like liveries and Ubers and really nuanced differences and um, in, in different types of sub-modes and, and, and private transportation, but also understanding how the budgets um, and how the operations work of the MTA and doing things that have never been done before, like Car Free Day, um, which was really a lot of work. <laughs> it's something that um, you know has had good results in other parts of the world, but something that New York City probably should have done a long time ago, and he was the one who came up with the idea and actually did it. Um, and, and I think also the other two things I'd like to say about uh, the chairman, which um, is really refreshing, is number one, his commitment to open data and platforms, and number two, ac academia and research. Um, I can't really think um, over time that there were that many people who, who've been so devoted in the transportation field to really understanding uh, academics, working with them so closely, knowing all of them, holding events, and incorporating them into policy, because a lot of the ideas should not be sitting on a shelf in, in, in some report somewhere. They should be actually put into use. So by bringing together policymakers from the government um, and the people that are making decisions, it's really refreshing to see, to see that. Um, you know, and also he's very persuasive. He turned this car guy into a bike guy, sort of. So uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, let's give a big round of applause to the council member. Um, we're going to jump into the meat of things uh, pretty quickly. It's a, a short day, and it was a holiday week. Um, and we want to uh, maybe refresh our minds and have an open mind to a lot of uh, new ways we can approach this topic. So we decided to break the day into you know, three segments. Number one, uh, we're going to hear from Cubic, uh, uh, Andy Taylor, who's going to talk a little bit about the data that was collected last year, 
um, and possibly what may be collected this year during Car Free Day. Then we're going to have a policy panel that's going to talk about not just what happened, but what may happen in, in the future in terms of uh, the cities and the governments um, and private industries uh, and stakeholders' plans to build on Car Free Day and have it possibly lead to, uh, by example, and by into different policies that could be implemented to better the trans transit system and the environment. And then uh, Camille's going to moderate the last panel where we're going to be talking about research. Um, what research um, has been done in this area is, is probably not enough, and what the plans are and what data that is really needed to do future research. Um, and anything from you know logistics to um, you know making car-free zones and, and that type of stuff, but also having the data to support um, you know, the academic studies that can lead to more policy changes.